Good morning, Bright Church. It's a pleasure to greet you on Easter morning. And I wanted to reach out to you this morning or afternoon or whenever you're watching this with a message from Scripture. You'll see an image that um, maybe you've seen before. It's a picture of a boy sitting on a porch. And you look at the joy in his face and you might think, it, it can't be real. But I guarantee you the joy is genuine, 100%. In fact, this boy has just received a package from the Junior Red Cross. You see, he spent the entire World War II in an orphanage. He spent it exiled from his parents who were killed. He spent part of his young life in a concentration camp. And in fact, these clothes, these shoes are the first new items that he has seen all war long. And he is expressing the joy of receiving this pair of boots. If you saw this photo for the first time and you didn't have any context, you might assume that he was faking it. Maybe this was an ad for a shoe company and they said, you know, if you act happy, we'll give you a present that you'll actually enjoy. You might be suspicious because no male that I've ever seen has ever been as happy about a pair of shoes as this boy has been. But it is real. And you can't really appreciate the photo, you can't really appreciate its significance if you don't understand its context, if you don't understand its importance. Understanding the backstory, understanding why somebody can be happy, why somebody is expressing that joy is as much as important as the photo itself. And if we looked at this photo for the first time, we'd probably draw the wrong conclusions. Sure, we might say, yeah, this boy is happy, he's gotten a present. It looks like an old photo, maybe in the 50s. He's sitting what looks like on a porch. Maybe his parents gave him, gave him a birthday present. And he's really happy for this pair of shoes. But if you thought that and you didn't understand what happened behind the scenes, you would miss the importance of the photo. You'd miss the death of his parents. You'd miss his time in a concentration camp. You'd miss his time in an orphanage. This photo would not have the significance that it has. And you see, when the photo is unremarkable, the backstory is important. And the story that I want to tell you today is a story that on its surface might seem unremarkable. We know about Easter. We know about the Bible. We know about church. And, and we see these things over and over and over again. And maybe we've forgotten the backstory. We've forgotten why these things are important. But they are. They're vitally important. And maybe, just like the photo, you've missed something. Maybe you think it's all a game, it's all a ploy, it's all somehow staged and it's somehow less important. You see it day in and day out and it's lost its significance for you. Maybe the actions of some people in church don't make sense to you. Maybe you don't understand why somebody would give their life to go on a missions trip, to devote their youth, to devote their time. Why would somebody do that? Why would anybody devote a portion of their life to something that you honestly can't see the significance of? And what you need to understand is the first important thing, the most important thing. In fact, if you understand this thing, it's kind of like a button on a shirt. Once you start on the top one, the rest of them line up. If you mess up the top one, luckily today I haven't done that, the rest of them are messed up. You need to understand the thing of first importance. If you get the first thing right, you'll get all of the things right. If you get the first thing wrong, you'll get all of them wrong. I want to open with you from Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As Paul writes about the resurrection, he writes about the significance and the importance of this event. 1 Corinthians 15.1 Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I teach you which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with scriptures. And he was buried, and he was raised on the third day in accordance with scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And he talks about this most important thing. He talks about the fact that we need to understand the most important thing, to understand anything at all. And here Paul starts with the beginning and he, he lays out the entire gospel for us. 
He says that Christ died for our sins. He was buried and then he rose again. And he wants to emphasize the fact that Christ really did die. There was a person such as Christ in history. Most historians today, they would agree that this person, Jesus Christ, lived and died in Galilee. He died in Jerusalem. He died in this area where he was supposed to have lived. And Paul, he emphasizes this fact. He starts that he died. And there are certain religions, there are certain sects that will say, you know what, he, uh, he didn't really die. His death was more of a metaphorical, maybe a spiritual death. Maybe he passed out and three days later he woke up from the trauma that he experienced, but that would not be the case. In fact, it is because he died that we have the story, the fact that Christ was risen again. And it says that Christ died not just for his sins, he died for our sins. The Gospels, Matthew and John and Luke, they all make a point to emphasize the fact that he did not die for his sins. When they talk about his crucifixion, when they talk about his trial, they never mention the fact that Christ had some kind of guilt. In fact, both Herod and Pilate say he had no guilt. Pilate went so far as to wash his hands of the whole affair. He said, this man is innocent, but he still put him to death. Christ was my substitute. He was your substitute. He didn't die for his sins. He didn't die for his iniquities. He died for ours. And if you read about uh, him in scripture, what you'll find is that uh, the psalmists, the uh, prophets, the uh, letters that are written to the churches, they all emphasize the fact that he died according to scripture. And there's many places we can look. And I want to take you to Isaiah, Isaiah 53. This is what it talks about when, he, when we talk about Jesus dying for our sins. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him as stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. For your sins and for my sins. Not for his misdeeds, but for ours. In verse 4, Paul says that he was also buried. It, it seems kind of trivial. Why, why did he need to be buried? Why did he need to be put in a tomb? Why couldn't he just die and then rise again? Well, Paul wants to make sure that we understand that he was dead. This wasn't metaphorical. This wasn't spiritual. And the story that we read in the Gospels of what Jesus endured, it wouldn't make sense that he would not die. It tells us that Jesus was punished. He was scourged. He was beaten to such a degree. He was blindfolded and he was struck over and over again. And then he was taken to a place of punishment where a scourge, a whip with specific implements designed to rip flesh from bone. He was tortured with that. And he was beaten and he was hurt to such a degree that he could not function. The human body was brought to such a point, the muscles and the bones, the blood that was in there was brought to such a point that he couldn't even carry his cross. And he died as a result of those uh, tortures being implemented on him. As he hung on the cross, one of the executioners, one who was skilled in this task, he took a spear and he jabbed it between the ribs and between his internal organs until he reached the heart. And he punctured that heart. And Jesus was 100% dead. He died and he was not metaphysically, he was not spiritually dead, he was physically dead. A 33-year-old man endured the most brutal punishment that was ever recorded. He was hung on a cross and he died to be buried. And then on the third day, he rose again. And that is important because he was both 100% dead, but then he was 100% alive. And it talks about the fact that he was witnessed to be alive by Paul, by the 12 apostles, by 500 other individuals. In fact, he says, if you don't trust my account, go and ask any one of them because most of them are still alive. And Paul saw it. We see it now. And if we understand this death, this punishment, and this resurrection, it's as though we get that first button right, the rest of them line up. 
Paul continues in Corinthians telling us about what the significance of the resurrection was. In verse 12 of chapter 15, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God, that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, even Christ, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope, in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. If Christ died and he remained, and there was no resurrection, and if we don't believe in this resurrection, then our faith is pointless. Christ is still in the ground. He is worm for food. He is food for worms. He has died and nothing else matters. Your life, your hope for the future does not matter. Sure, you might have 50 or 60 years of time on this earth and you can do good things. And you might be remembered. You might be remembered by your kids. You might be remembered by your grandkids. Maybe you'll even go down in history as one of the greats. But you will be dead and your life will count for nothing. There are far more better things to do on Easter Sunday than watching a sermon. There are far better things to do if the resurrection is not real. If what Christ did is not real. It doesn't matter in the end. But that's not what it says. Christ has been raised. He is risen. In verse 20, it talks about the fact that he was raised as the first fruits of those who will rise. What does that mean? It means that he was the first of many. There will be some who will come after him. There are those who are now rising uh, from the dead in eternity because of him. And he is the one who made that possible. And the question is, can you stop yourself from doing any of the things that you want to do? Can you stop from sinning? Can you turn your life around? No, you can't. You, as much as you might try, you might have some success, but in the end, you will still be in your sins. And if Christ did not rise from the dead, he can't help you either. He can't be the one to be the first fruit of all of this, of all of this process of resurrection and rebirth and new life. Without the resurrection, there is no hope. And Paul says that because he rose from the dead, this power is available to you. This power of a changed life is available to you. The resurrection, the Easter Sunday celebration is what gives us that power. And the thing is, our reaction to this risen Jesus isn't usually so dramatic. We think that maybe this is of some importance, but we don't give it the importance that it deserves. You know, we read in Revelations how um, this apostle who writes Corinthians to us, what kind of interaction he had with Jesus. And then we read about John in Revelations. He saw Jesus again for the first time after his death. And this is what happened when he interacted. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. John sees Jesus for the first time since his ascension into heaven. And Jesus comes out to him and he says, I have died, I have risen again, and not only that, I have the keys to life and death. And John's reaction is maybe not what we'd expect. I mean, if you saw a friend for the first time after a great and long absence, what would your reaction be? And John reacts by falling to the ground. He reacts by falling in front of Jesus. And Jesus, here's the thing, he makes these stunning claims against himself. He says, I am the first and the last. I hold these keys to eternal life. I am eternal. I am God himself. And it's not normal for people to talk like that. 
It's not normal for people to reference themselves like that. Nobody in my conversations has ever said anything nearly as close and as glorious as that. And what happens with John is he hears these words. He hears Jesus and he, sa- and he falls at his feet. He understands the glory before which he stands. You know, I've had lots of interactions with people and I've never had an interaction similar to the one that John had with Jesus. You know, people will come up to me, they will not fall down and worship me. Most of the time people come up to me and they say, meh. John doesn't see Jesus and go, meh. Hi, good friend. Hi, buddy. How have you been? He falls down before him. He understands in whose presence he stands. We often think about Jesus. We think about that photo of the orphan. And we think, oh, that has no significance. But once we understand the backstory, once we understand who we're standing before, our reaction changes. And Jesus, he doesn't let us have a reaction of just meh. He says, I am the eternal one. I am God incarnate. I am far beyond normal. And Jesus points to himself and he says, I am the truth, the way, and the life. And John isn't the only one who reacts like this. When Thomas saw Jesus for the first time after he rose from the dead, he fell before him and he said, my Lord and my God. We don't have that kind of reaction to normal people. We don't have that kind of interaction with normal individuals. And Jesus, he didn't call himself a good person. He didn't call himself a good man. He called himself God. And the only time that people call themselves something so glorious, so eternal, is either if they're crazy or if they're evil. And we've had plenty of examples of both in our lives. We have plenty of examples of people calling themselves glorious, calling themselves eternal, calling themselves the kings of the entire world. Yet they always fail. They always fall and they always bring about evil that we cannot even manifest. And John's reaction is, he fell and he thought that he was dead. He fell as though he was dead. His reaction to Jesus was, I am going to die. And that should be the reaction of any individual who comes in contact with the real God. Any individual who sees God for the first time, who sees him for all he's worth, who understands the backstory of the picture, who understands the significance of who's standing before them, their interaction, their reaction should be one of falling down and worshiping. And we have to ask ourselves on Easter morning, is that the reaction that we have? Are we seeing an image that we've seen so many times? An image that we can't possibly see as important anymore? John's reaction was falling and worshiping. And we'll often look at other things. We'll look at other believers. We'll see the hypocritical nature of individuals. We'll see people falling away from the faith and we'll say, how can I possibly believe in that? How can I possibly see the glory of that? And we fail to understand that we're not looking at Christ himself. We're not looking at our fallen Savior. We're not looking at our risen Savior. And Jesus, what does he do? He lays his hand on him and he says, rise. He does the same thing to all of us. His resurrection allows him to do that. He calls us out of our sin. He tells us, look, rise. I understand that you look at me and you compare me with you and you see perfection and you can't stand in front of that perfection and you see your own sin and you can't stand before me with that sin. But he says, rise because I'm going to give you my blood. I will wash you clean and I will make you whole and I will make you new. John's reaction should be our reaction. John's falling before Christ should be what we do before Christ. And all of these things, they're undeniable. We can't deny that Christ existed. We can't deny that he uh, died. We can't deny that he rose from the dead. Yet we sometimes still have doubt. We want to be convinced. We want to have something more than that. We don't see its significance. We, un- we don't understand why this would happen. And you see, Jesus tells us to not fear. He tells us that we should not look upon all of the things around us. We shouldn't look at our sin and we should not fear that He is going to look upon us and He will cast us down. 
but rather that he will look at us and give us light. If you have ever seen any of the famous masters of the Renaissance, masters of European art, you've probably seen a painting by Rembrandt. And his paintings, they stand out, they have a unique feel to them. You see, because a lot of his paintings are this dark canvas. And it looks like as though a spotlight has been shown in, on a central event. Maybe on a rebellion, maybe on people getting together. And the pictures are often very stereotypically European. It looks like maybe he's been painting the musketeers. But what you notice is there's a dramatic use of light. And his secret turned out to be that he would spend a long, long time darkening his canvas putting in black, putting in dark, putting in brown. And when you wonder why would he spend so much time painting in the black, well that's because he wanted to make sure that the light was as bright and as contrasting to the darkness as could possibly be. He wanted to make sure that the darkness was in contrast to the light. And our lives often feel like a Rembrandt painting before he started drawing in the light. Our hearts are darkened. Our hope is futile. We have nothing to look forward to, especially in a time like this. We look around at the world and we have nothing to hope for. And Jesus comes in with hope for us. And I want to offer you a perspective on faith. I want to give you a um, look at faith that maybe you've not looked at before. What happens when a immovable object meets an unstoppable force? Well, what you determine, what you figure out, is that one of those things is not what it appears to be. Either the object is movable or the force is stoppable. And faith and our faith in God is much like that. I want to give you this um, retelling, uh, I want to give you this definition of faith that I found so encouraging. Pastor J.D. Greer says this, Faith is when the unexplainable meets the undeniable. Faith is when the unexplainable meets the undeniable. Faith is the afterglow of the collision of two things that seem impossible. And I know some of you, you have doubts. You have doubts about what Christ means for you. Maybe you have doubts in whether Christ came and died for you at all. And I want to put those fears to rest. I want to put those doubts to rest. Because what happened is that Christ came. That is an undeniable fact and he died for you. And yes, there are hows and whys, but those hows and whys pale in contrast to the truth that we have. That He died for us, that He rose from the dead. And this is the gospel, this is the good news. The fact that we can have trust in Christ. The fact that He, like Rembrandt, painted brightness into our life. Our whole world was dark. There is no hope, there is no future. There is death and then there is darkness. And yet, upon His resurrection, He has given us light. Those streams of light have shone through and they have given us all the hope that we need. Christ has risen. Christ has risen and he has given us that light. And let that message of Easter be the thing that guides you in these dark times. And let it be the light that shines through whatever darkness and doubt that you have. Amen. Let me close in prayer. Um, uh, and give you uh, something to think about during this Sunday. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. We come before you with a realization of the significance and the importance of Easter. Lord, we often look at uh, Scripture, we often look at this celebration as an old photo. We see it has some kind of value, we see it has some kind of importance, but we completely miss the backstory. We miss its significance. And I ask you on this day that we would see that significance. That we would see the significance of your word. That we would see the significance of your blessings. That we would see the significance of your resurrection. And Lord, just as Rembrandt painted these paintings of darkness to give us a contrast to the light, your resurrection gives us a contrast. It gives us light and it gives us hope in a world that is hopeless. And we're so grateful for that. And I ask for anybody who doesn't have that hope, who hasn't put their trust in you, that they would be able to do that. And that through that, they would be able to have eternal life. Life that you've given. Life that you've given to all of us. Amen.